Well, happy Resurrection Day, everybody. Happy Easter. We're uh, we're so thrilled that uh, spring has come, that life is back. We're thankful for our Savior who makes all things new and is making uh, people new as well. And uh, I'm so thankful for the new things in our lives because of Jesus. And one of those things we're going to celebrate today are some new members that we're welcoming to our church Um, And uh, I'll tell you, uh, out of the five people we're welcoming into membership today, um, most of them were in the first service. So um, today, if uh, your name is on the screen, would you stand up so that we can recognize you and welcome you? And one of them is back at the camera this morning, serving faithfully, and his bride... Yes. So that's Ivan and Tiffany Gruenthal. Welcome, guys. Um, wait a minute, what took you so long? You've been here for so long. But uh, actually, we're thr- thrilled that you made it, uh, uh, made it official. And in the first service, Tom and Dora Albert were here, as well as Jim Hickman. So we are so thrilled to have you as part of the family. And uh, for those of you who are like, what in the world is happening here this morning? Um, these folks have been coming to church for a while. They've been coming to Grace for a little bit, seeing what we're about, what we're for, what we're teaching, and what we're proclaiming. And uh, they actually came to First Step, um, what Becca spoke about earlier. And they got to meet the staff, meet some of the leaders, hear where the church is going. And in all of that, the Lord was continuing to stir their hearts and just uh, encourage their hearts to say, man, this is my church home. I need to make this my church family. And so today, we are officially welcoming you into uh, the family here at Grace, and we're thankful to have you. So uh, can we just say welcome to them this morning? Well, and before you leave today, make sure you not only welcome those who are visiting with us and, uh, and here for the first time, but also uh, make sure you give a special uh, fist bump or uh, if they've got a green bracelet on it, I think you can give them a hug uh, at, and, uh, and at least a, a, you know, a, a holy handshake or something like that. Just welcome them and say, uh, glad to have you part of the family. Um, but hey, good morning and uh, we're thrilled you're here. Thanks for choosing grace. I'm just going to tell you, you made a great decision. I believe God has some great things for us, as if we haven't already experienced some wonderful blessings in the service this morning. But um, why don't you grab your Bibles, because there's some more coming. Uh, Isaiah 53 is our passage, so turn there, if you will. And we're going to be finishing uh, that passage, the last three verses of that chapter this morning, uh, what was began on Good Friday. The title of today's message is The Successful savior the successful savior now everybody wants to be successful right everybody wants to be a success in life i mean none of you woke up this morning going man i'm hoping today's going to be a real bummer i'm looking forward to being a failure underachieving in pretty much everything i do man i don't want to do well in any nobody wakes up doing that nobody wants their life to be insignificant and not count we want to be a success And we want to be successful in this life. Now, if we took what the world thinks of success and applied it to Jesus, how would he measure up? I mean, what is success to the world? Um, Can I hear some of you this morning? Um, What are things that the world regards as success? I'll give you uh, new folks just a heads up. Like in church here at Grace, it's okay to participate. Uh, We encourage that. So you can talk back in church. So uh, I'll ask you again. How does the world view success? What are things that that the world points to and says, that's success, that's successful. What does it look like? Money, right? Money, 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 money. Wow, I wasn't sure I was going to get up to that one, but but praise God. All right, Uh, so money, what else, what else? A big house, right? A big, big house. I got a song for them all, I think, right? All right, what else? Fame, right? I want everybody to know my name. I want to be a a legacy here for everyone to know, right? What else? Business cards. That's success, right? If you got business cards, right? All right, teenagers, you can all buy some business cards, Instaprint, really cheap, right? You'll be a success overnight, right? What else? Race a nice car or a race car? Hey, man, I'll take both, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah? A nice car, right? Yeah, you'll be, be styling in that. Yeah, all of these are different things that the world views, and they look at, and they go, success, success, right? 
You're a success if you have health or you have wealth. You have success if you have achievement and accolades. You have success if you have position or power or prestige. This is what the world views as success. Now, if we took the world's version of success and we looked at Jesus' life, the life that the, the, the Son of God who came to earth took on humanity and dwelt among us and lived his life, the God-man before us, and all he dwelt in and all he did and all he accomplished, and then we look at Good Friday and his life ending at the cross and the death that he... Man, no one would think that Jesus was a success. In fact, in the world's eyes, Jesus is a failure savior. He's failed completely. He's not someone to follow. I mean, he didn't have riches and wealth. I mean, at the end of his life, he only had like 120 followers. I mean, I have more than that on Facebook. How about you, right? I mean, come on, Jesus. What's your problem, right? When we're looking through the world's eyes, but what really counts and what really lasts and what is eternal success and what does that look like? When we judge according to God's standards, in our passage today, we will see that Jesus is exalted and high, and he is the success of God before us. And he achieved the success of God for us as well. And the beauty is, is that the success of Jesus is allowed for you today. And it is offered to you today. It is available to you today. And so can you be successful? Jesus would say, yes, by faith, it is available to you. In fact, let's uh, look at uh, Isaiah 53 and see how God's word speaks of the successful Savior. Verse 10 says, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. And when his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, and he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. We're going to stop there and just listen to this first point. In fact, you might even write it down in your notes today. Write it in your Bible. Write it in your uh, smartphone if you have to. Um, but write this down because you're going to want to hear this. No matter how painful, God's plan will prosper. No matter how painful, no matter how difficult... No matter how grim the outlook, God's plan will always prosper. And God's plan, His will will be accomplished. And we saw that through the life of Christ. In fact, as you remember reading, it said, It was the will of the Lord to crush Him. He has put Him to grief, and when His soul makes an offering for guilt. Do you know that the cross and the life that Jesus lived here was no accident at all? It wasn't like God was like, oh my gosh, something happened and i got to send Jesus all of a sudden. No, no, no. Before the foundations of the earth were laid, before creation was ever spoken into existence, God the Father had determined in His plan, in His purpose, in, in His will that Jesus would come to earth. But as Scripture says, it wasn't just that Jesus would come. God's plan, God the Father was looking at His Son and He's like, man, I'm going to crush you and I'm going to crucify you. I mean, think of how Jesus, in his life as he came to earth, experienced the crushing of God. I mean, just going through what, what Pastor Johnny had preached through Isaiah 53, 1 through 9, how Jesus was the unexpected Savior. Like, we wouldn't have been drawn to him. In fact, the scriptures say he had no form or majesty that we would desire him. You wouldn't pick him for your, for your basketball team. You wouldn't pick him to be uh, the person that you want to follow in life. You wouldn't choose him if he came in. You would be, wouldn't even be drawn to him. He would be average. He would be ordinary. He would be somebody that you would be like, okay, he's just like everybody else. Jesus didn't come with notoriety. He didn't come with the trumpets and the, the, the grand parades. He came in a stable and in a barn. God's plan was to crush him. We see it also when it says that he was hated and he was rejected by people. Everywhere he went, he experienced the hate of the masses. They would gnash their teeth at him. They would turn against him. They would betray him and walk away from him. And they would reject his message. I mean, how many want to sign up for that role, right? But that was God's plan to crush him. And it goes on. 
we even see that he, by, he experienced oppression and judgment, right? Like Jesus was judged. Anybody like it when you get judged, right? Like, I, I mean, that's just the best experience, right? I mean, I signed up to be a pastor because, man, I heard that it gets judged all the time. I mean, every week, you're judged. Every weekday, you're judged. For the rest of my life, I'm like, man, I get to be judged. Let me be a pastor, right? I don't know what, I don't know, how about, how about you in your life? Do you like it when you're judged? No. It's horrific. It's, but for Jesus, God had planned to crush him through judgment and oppression. Or you see it so many other ways. Uh, verse 14 of 52, it says, his appearance was so marred beyond human resemblance that Jesus was beaten so badly. It wasn't like some, uh, some uh, you know, just a little bit of ju- uh, blood or a little cut on the side. No, Jesus was beaten to a pulp. He was beaten so bloodied and so bad. It, it was probably worse than the Passion of the Christ movie. You know that movie that you're like, man, I saw it once, I'm glad I did, but man, I never want to see that again. And you were just so horrified to go. Like, he wasn't even, he wasn't even somebody that resembles a person. Like you didn't even see and know who he was. Or to think that he was chastised, that he was cut off from the land of the living, or his grave was with the wicked, or he was this, we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God, pierced. Man, we thought that God was against him. No sign of success because the plan of God was to crush him, right? And to crucify him. I don't know about you, but I hear that and I'm like, what loving father does that? Like I'm telling you, like when my kids were, were conceived, when, when they were growing in my wife's womb, when, when, when my kids came out and were born, I wasn't sitting there going, woohoo, now let the beatings begin. Looking forward to crushing you, buddy, right? Now, that may happen on the basketball court every once in a while. I'll tell you that, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm talking about, Evan, right? <laughs> but I'm telling you, man, like, how can a loving father have a plan to crush their child? I mean, none of us would do that. Why would God plan for that? Why would that be his purpose from before the world began? Why? Two reasons. Number one, because you needed someone to take that crushing and someone to take that crucifixion, someone to take that penalty in your place. I needed that. We all needed that. But also because Jesus came so that he would show the Father that he would show the measure of his glory, the measure of his character, the full extent, so that when you saw Jesus and you saw all that was happening, not only in his life, but also in the cross and the resurrection, you saw the glory of God. You saw his character displayed. You saw that God was a God of justice and yet a God of mercy. You saw that God was a God of compassion and yet a God who was not with compromise. You saw that he was a God who loved, a God who was tender and yet a God who was firm and held to his word a God who was faithful and yet he was true you saw the beauty and the full character of God on display to behold the full measure of his glory through Jesus so it was God's plan and purpose that would prosper in the life of Jesus but here's the thing God's not up in heaven all about making everybody's life horrible right God is not in the business of being against you and fighting against you for the purpose of just sitting here going like, man, all I want to do is crush them every single day of my life. Now, some of you walked in and you're like, man, that's what God feels like to me. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know which God you're preaching, but man, the God I've heard about, the God I know, he ain't such a nice guy. Can I point you to the scriptures? Because it doesn't end there. The story doesn't finish there. The book has not been fully written. If we just end on Good Friday or at the cross or in the grave, the reality is Easter happened. The reality is the exaltation of Christ happened. And the reality is is no matter how painful, God's plan will prosper. Notice how Jesus would prosper at all as well. It says, when his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, right? Jesus died without ge- a generation to follow him, without descendants who would come from him. And, and in those days, if you didn't have children, you were poor. 
And if you didn't have children to follow after, you would be forgotten from the face of the earth. And, and so to have children is a blessing. To have the, your name continue on is, is a blessing from God, a reward from God, and a prospering. And so it says that he will see his offspring. And while Jesus didn't have physical children, he has so many spiritual children who are coming to him by faith. So many so that we will glory in the work of God in every single life that has been saved. He will see his offspring, but then it says he shall prolong his days. You know what? We don't serve a, a Savior who is in the grave, who is dead and buried, and we venerate his tomb to this day. No, we serve a Savior who is risen, who conquered death and, and came back to life, and who conquered Satan, who conquered sin, and took our sins upon himself. No matter how painful, God's plan will prosper and Jesus lives forever that is a successful savior not one who has failed and still in the ground but God's plan will prosper no matter how painful I have a friend named Mike and I've had uh, had this friend for many years and it's not myself right I, I'm kind of friendly with myself too but um, I'm not speaking about myself I'm talking about my friend Mike and on the outward appearance, Mike had everything. I'm telling you, Mike had the trophy car. <laughs> we talked about it earlier. He had the trophy job. Talked about that. He had the trophy wife. And he had the trophy house. I mean, he had it all. If you were judging success, you would look at this guy. If you wanted to pick out a life and go, which life do I want to be? You'd be like, this guy, can I have it? I want all of it and, and, and the cake too, right? I want that life. And yet it was God's purpose in his life to crush him. God's purpose in his life to bring an end to all of it. And, and Mike lost in, in a matter of, of what seemed like months, but maybe years, he lost everything. The car was demolished. The car was demolished. The job, he lost. The wife, the trophy wife, came to him and said, I don't love you anymore. I want a divorce. And you know what comes with that? They had to sell that trophy house so they could pay for the divorce and split the assets. And in a, mo in a moment in time, God took everything from him. I remember t reaching out to him and connecting with him a, li a little bit later. And man, I, I expected to see a man who was disillusioned. I expected to see a man who was depressed. I expected to see a man who was utterly, completely broken. And what I experienced in talking to this man was totally revolutionary. When I spoke with him, what I heard was hope. When I sensed his spirit, what I felt was peace. When I heard his words and the countenance of his face, I experienced joy. And I'm like, where does this come from? And how is he? And then all of a sudden he goes, Jesus. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. Because Mike was such a scoffer. He was so hardened to the things of God, and yet in God's plan for him, he would crush him and so that he would turn and see his need for a Savior and turn from his sin and find hope and peace and joy in the Lord. And so the success of Jesus would become his. Not the worldly success that we look to, but the eternal success that he will revel in forever. No matter how painful, God's plan will prosper. Are you here today and you, you are thinking of the Lord, how, how could he be so against me? Or how could this pain be so difficult? Or why would God allow this? Uh, my, uh, the lady cutting my hair this week uh, told me about how she could not follow the Lord because God took away her mother. And it wasn't until someone in her life Years later would come and say, man, God did that to get a hold of your heart, man. She saw it differently, and the eyes opened, and she was like, Jesus is not against me, but he's for me. She was telling me her testimony in sport clips, man. I'm talking holy ground, holy spirit experience, getting your hair cut. 
you didn't do too bad a job either, you know. Which sometimes when they start talking too much, you're like, how's this going to go, right? But I'm telling you, it went awesome, right? No, I'm not talking about that. The pain that you experience in your life is for a reason. And God has allowed it for a purpose. And he does nothing willy-nilly. And he does nothing from a capricious heart. But he loves you. And maybe that thing that is in your life that is wrenching your spirit, he is simply allowing so that you would turn your eyes to heaven and say, God, help. He wants to help. He wants to bring the success of his Savior into your life for you today. Would you receive him? No matter how painful God's plan will prosper. Here's the second thing we see. No matter how vile God's virtue is available. Look in verse 11. It says this. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquity. No matter how vile God's virtue is available no matter how wretched God's righteousness is offered, God is offering to you today the righteousness of Christ, the virtue of Jesus. And how did it come? It come, came out of the anguish of His soul. Did you hear that? I mean, so many times when we look at what Jesus suffered and how Jesus suffered, we think physically, don't we? We go, man, He was beaten. He was, his beard was ripped out. I mean, they thrust the crown of thorns upon him. They whipped him with a whip that was, uh, that was ended in, in like uh, metal and glass and, 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 um, and, and pieces of bone that when you whipped on the back of him, it would rip shreds and stripes upon the back and the blood would flow like massive. And we look at that and the crucifixion and Christ on the cross. And we go, man, what a sacrifice. And so many of us, we, we say, man, why, how could somebody do that for me? And yet I would tell you today by the authority of Scripture that that wasn't the greatest sacrifice. Rather, Scripture says that out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. And by his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted as righteous. Think of the anguish of his soul. Think of the suffering that he must have endured just simply by leaving the, the paradise of heaven and as a perfect human, uh, God in the flesh, living among this sin-corrupted and stained world. That must have been jarring immediately being entered into this place. And then to walk around and to experience the anguish of soul. It says that he bore our, our, bore our griefs and carried our burdens. I mean, this perfect individual is walking the earth and he's seeing the brokenness. Have, have you, how many of you know this world is jacked? This world is broken. And just people treat each other like horrifically. And there's wickedness that reigns in this world, man. And it's broken. It just doesn't work. It's filled with such sorrow and discouragement. Our hearts go, man, this couldn't be the way it was meant to be. And yet Jesus saw that and he walked amidst this, not as we do, but with a perfect vision, with a perfect union with God the Father. And he saw the brokenness of man and how his heart must have been a man of sorrow. Such deep sorrow. Or think of the anguish of his soul carrying our sins. As it says, he bore his sins on himself. Scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that God the Father made Jesus to be sin. Him who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. Do you know what that means? That means that on the cross... It wasn't just about nails in the hand and in the feet. It was about God taking the sin of mankind. Your sin, my sin, all the sin of those who have walked this earth before us. Taking that sin and in a great exchange putting that sin upon Him who was sinless. Him who was virtuous. Him who did no wrong and walked blamelessly in perfect obedience to the Father. And yet He would receive all of our sins upon Himself. Imagine that. 
Anybody who's been wrongly accused in any sense feels the anguish of that. Take everyone's sin and experience that upon the cross. Or then the anguish of his soul to feel the separation from his Father. When the sky grew dark and the Lord turned his face away because he could not live with the sin of his, that is on his Son, he turns his face and Jesus feels the separation from his Father. This perfect communion that he's experienced. Not just prayers that we pray and we're like, man, I'm hoping they're getting to Jesus. I'm hoping they're getting to the Lord. But he knew intimacy at all times and now it was gone. And the separation so much so that Jesus would cry out and go, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And to experience the wrath of God poured out on Jesus for our sin. That's the anguish of his soul. What was experienced spiritually far outweighs, eternally outweighs what was experienced simply in the flesh. And out of the anguish of his soul, it says, though, he has made many to be accounted as righteous. To justify many. Do you know what that's like? Do you know what that means? That means that there was a great exchange for all who would trust in him by faith. That your sins would be upon Jesus and he would grant to you his righteousness. He would give to your account. Like, how many, how many of you received a stimulus check within the last year, right? Right? At least one of them, right? Go ahead, throw your hands up. You don't have to be ashamed, right? You didn't do anything to earn it, right? You got a stimulus check, right? For those of you who use direct deposit, guess what happened? You woke up one day and you're like, whoa, there's cash in here. And where'd that come from? Can I get more? And how does this happen? And where's this going? And who's going to pay for this? What? Uh, you know, like all those questions, but you're like just thrilled that something's been credited to your account, right? I mean, a a anybody remember Octomom? I mean... She's got like a ton of kids, right? Octomom. Well, guess how much her stimulus package was? The late, latest one? 14 grand, man, she's getting. Octomom family? 14 grand. You think that's amazing? Well, what about the Duggar family? I mean, they got tons of kids, right? They didn't get 14 grand. They got 14 billion, right? I mean, yeah, they did. They, that's how many kids they have. Seriously. It is that many. It's like off the, off the chain. Like, knock it off, right? 14 bit yeah, some of you are like man i'm so angry i didn't get a stimulus check it's because of the duggars right so take it out on them i know i'm frustrated too why right that's just where you go the glory of a stimulus check think of it from a spiritual perspective your account though doesn't just have the amount that you've made and what you've saved or how much you're in debt your account has so many zeros in the negative that they stopped counting and they, and they basically just finished with dot, dot, dot. That's how in debt we are spiritually. That's how vile we are spiritually. And yet what occurred for us is that the righteousness of God would be credited to our account, right? And it ain't just like, man, 14,000 or 14 billion, man. It was so much that was credited to your account that the bank broke. It just broke. You went to log into your account, man, and you're looking at the screen and it goes, um, there's an error and the bank is broken, come back in an hour, hopefully we'll have it fixed, right? Because the righteousness that was credited to your account was so great so great that we couldn't even understand it. We could not even hold it. And yet that's the beauty of what comes. That no matter how vile, God's virtue is available because of the anguish of the soul of our Savior. That is the success of God that is available to us. His success in righteousness and obedience is available to you. And let me tell you, you need it. I need it. Why? Because we are vile, right? My friend uh, Ricky came to preach here, man, multiple years ago. And, uh, and, and if you were here, you would have heard his testimony, but I, I'm sure m many of you probably weren't. But Ricky came and shared his testimony, and he's got a testimony like, man, like dramatic. I mean, Ricky had, uh, talk about vile. I mean, this guy was a gangbanger, but he was a gangbanger 
to the nth degree. I mean, he was gang leader and everything. I mean, he had a reputation in the community for criminal behavior, for vandalism, for uh, abuse and trespasses, like all over the place. Like, he was known as a criminal. So much so, he was, he was bragging about it by, by you, know, you know when they get the tattoos under their eyes, the little eye drop that, that speaks for murder? Like, he had those. So much so was this vile man committing murder and committing a sin like this. And, and, and the community saw it and he bragged about it. And God in His mercy decided to crush him. And they got a hold of him, threw him in prison. And that was the greatest thing that ever happened to him. Because Ricky would tell you the story that in the midst of prison, all of a sudden he's confronted with the reality that he's not that great and he's not as amazing as he thinks he is on the outside. And in reality, what he realizes is he is quite vile as a human being, but really eternally vile. And yet in the midst of that prison, someone came in and said, hey, there's a God who wants to forgive you. And, and even better, there's a God who wants to give you an expunged record and a brand new record, a record of perfect righteousness. And, and everything Jesus accomplished, he wants to give to you. And Ricky was broken by the kindness of God in that moment. And he said, how could someone offer such a gift as that? And he gave his life to Christ that very day. And his life was transformed, right? And now he lives every single day to tell everybody that they can know Jesus and they can get this, this gift of, uh, of God for them, man. I'm so thankful. He, he's got a ministry called Frontline uh, Ministry, man. Uh, check it out. Uh, great, powerful story, powerful man of God. So thankful for him. But here's the reality. We think of vile people and we go, it's the Rickies of the world. Or it's, or it's people who make Satan shoes or satanic music videos, and we're like, that's vile, right? That's the worst. But spiritually speaking, loved ones, all of us are the vile ones. Scripture says that we have all fallen short of the glory of God. And there is no one righteous, no, not one. And the reality is, is, is maybe, you are, maybe your sins are sanitized, Maybe your sins are easy like greed or, or, or gossip or, or, or lying or I dishonored my parents. Or maybe your sins are, are, are hidden and, and, and the world doesn't get to see it. Your sins are behind the scenes and you're, you're a hidden drug addict or you're a, you're a, you're a hidden uh, sex offender or, or whatever your situation is and you've got that hidden behind the scene. The reality is, is, spiritually speaking, loved ones, we are all spiritually vile and all desperately in need of Jesus. And no matter how many good things you do or how many ways you try to clean your life up or make your life righteous, the only thing that solves the problem is to put your faith in Jesus, to come to know Him by faith, to turn from your sins and say, man, Jesus, I need your help. Would you give me the virtue of God for this vile one like me? Would you do that today? You could have the success of God credited to your account if you turn to Him by faith. The blessings go on. Verse 12 says, Therefore I will divide him a portion with many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. You know what the point is here, loved ones? No matter how humiliated, no matter how humiliated, God's servant will be exalted. No matter how humiliated, God's servant will will be exalted. And Jesus was humiliated. Make no mistake about it. Jesus humbled Himself and was humbled as well when He came to this world. Not only just taking on human flesh, not only taking on the sins of mankind, but also as it says, that He was counted or numbered with the transgressors. 
Jesus who was perfect, Jesus who was sinless, Jesus who did nothing wrong, was falsely accused, and now he was murdered as if he was a criminal. And he was buried among the criminals, right? And Jesus was treated as one whom God had turned his face from and God had smited against. And the world was going, God, he is not God's man. He is not God's servant, not God's Messiah. Jesus also bore the sins of the world. He was even humiliated even to the point of death. And he humbled himself even to death on a cross, the scripture says. But no matter how humiliated, God's servant will be exalted. Jesus did that for the glory of our God, the glory of our Father, but also for you. He humbled himself, leaving heaven to come for you, to come for me, to come for us, to take the punishment that we deserved. And he humbled himself to that. And Jesus is promised of God, I will exalt you. I will lift you up. The story doesn't end at the grave. The story will end with you on the throne and you glorious before all of mankind and all of creation. And Jesus will be exalted. Jesus was. In fact, it says, uh, therefore I will divide him a portion with the many. That God was actually going to give him a special position out of all the masses. God's like, man, I'm carving out a place for you. And you're going to be in a position above all. And he's lifting him up. Yes, you will be humbled and humiliated. Yes, I will crush you, but it will not end there. I will exalt you. I will lift you up, Jesus. And then it says that he will divide the spoil with the strong. Some of your Bibles may say booty, right? He will divide the booty, right? All the riches, all the wealth, all the possessions, everything that we won in this glorious battle. Jesus, God's carving out the portion to give to him he's like man i'm dividing the spoils that says that god is also going to reward his faithful servant god is not only giving the position but also the reward and it would not end with good friday but it would be the rewards of easter it would be the rewards of an exalt exaltation that would be eternal and would be for all mankind no matter how humiliated god's servant will be exalted. It's funny, I have a, I have a daughter who's, um, it's not funny actually as a father, because I watch this and I'm, I, I'm somewhat sad watching how God has been working in her heart. Because it seems like this is something that God has specifically chosen like time and time again to just bring humiliation to her, bring humbling into her life. I mean, like she... Um, Man, she, she's a, she works amazingly hard at, like, running cross-country. And I'm telling you, man, she worked harder than anyone on the team. In fact, her coaches even told her so. But you know what? She was always getting passed up, even by the younger kids. You know, all of a sudden, the freshmen's come, and she's a junior, and they're, like, running faster than her. She's like, what? How does this happen? Or even in junior high, like this girl who was like uh, neck and neck, and they were together. Like you see these girls along the, t- along the way, they get this growth spurt. They get this running spurt, and all of a sudden they take off. They take the next level. My daughter never got that. I'm like, what in the world, Lord? And continued this way over and over and until like the very last race of the very last year that she would run in her high school career. She won the race. I mean, literally, I remember watching her come out of the... Yeah, she was coming out of the forest after all the girls go in, and I see this first person come, and you know me, I've been watching this for like six, seven years now. I'm like, not my daughter. And then all of a sudden I look, and I had just put, on, put in my contacts that day, and I'm like, this is Alex! I'm like, Kat, Kat, that's my daughter! And I'm like running, I'm running with her. I'm like, you go, you go! And we're running all the way to the finish line, and I'm like, that's my girl, that's my girl! She's doing it! I'm like, crazy dad, right? And I'm like, now I'm that guy that I've been like despising all the other dads who do that. And I'm like, that's me, right? And she finishes, runs through it, and basically just about collapses, but I'm like, no way. So thankful that God would, would bless her with the, just that fruit at the end. 
to say, I see you. I see how hard you worked. And though you've been humiliated, though you've been humbled, God's servant will be exalted. And here's the reality. This is the way of the gospel. And this is the way that God works with his people. In fact, it says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, it says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. And at the proper time, he will exalt you. He will lift you up. He will exalt you. He will lift you up. Have you experienced the humbling of God in your life? The humiliation in your life? Maybe you've experienced the Passover for a promotion that you feel like, man, I totally deserve that. I totally ace that. Or you didn't get the job that, man, it should have been yours. And you're like, where in the world? Or maybe you were just passed over because you were faithful to the ways of God. And you're like, man, I can't do that and, and still honor my Savior. And because of that, they're like, yeah, you don't work well here then because of that. Or maybe you've experienced the rejection and relationship that sometimes comes as well, right? That rejection that says, yeah, yeah, um, if you're not going to participate in this and be, uh, and be with us in that, if you're not going to celebrate with us about these types of things, yeah, yeah you, you can't, we're not friends. You're canceled, right? Maybe you've experienced that in your life. Or maybe for some of you, Maybe you feel like God has just kept you small for some reason. Or he's kept you weak. Or maybe he's kept you unknown or under-resourced. Or just maybe insignificant. And you're like, why? I've worked so hard, Lord. I think, I'd, I, think I could do a lot for your glory if you just kind of like... Like, I don't have all the answers for you. I can't tell you everything that God is doing in your life. But what I can tell you is that the way of God is humble yourself before me. And then there'll come a time. Maybe that time won't even be on this earth. Maybe that time is just going to be the time when you stand before Jesus and give an account for your life. And he's like, man, I'm going to, you'll get the position and the reward then. Or maybe for some of you, you need to just hear it from the gospel today. That if you're going to be able to experience the success of God, man, you've got to humble yourself first. To know the goodness of the gospel, you have to humble yourself. And maybe you heard me talking about the vial and, and, and saying, hey, guess you're, what? You're part of it. And you got all angry inside. And you got all you know, arrogant inside going, don't tell me I'm vile. I am not like that guy. I'm not like that woman. I am not vile. In fact, I've done so much good. And, and if you looked at my life, there's way more good than there is evil in my life. Don't tell me. Can I speak with gentleness to you today? As gentle as I know, I'm just going to tell you that is the pride of sin in your life and it's keeping you from knowing the goodness of the gospel. Would you humble yourself to him today? Would you say to him, yes, Lord, I do need you. Yes, Lord, I recognize I have not kept your law completely and I haven't reached the standard of righteousness that you have set which is perfection. But Jesus did. And so I come to you today and just say, please, I'm humbling myself to you in faith, asking that you would give me the virtue of God for my vileness today. You can know the success of God in your life, credited to your account in this very moment. So we're going to close with where we began. Who wants to be successful? Who wants the success that really matters in their lives? The world's got a way. And they've got a plan. And the Bible says that 
is a way that seems right to a man or to a woman or to a child. But in the end, it only leads to death. There's the world's way or there's God's way, which is through Jesus, the successful Savior who offers you all of that success if you would come to him by faith today. Would you come? Let's pray about that together. Heavenly Father, we would come to you today and on this resurrection day, remembering the goodness that you have offered to us. Not only the goodness of the victory that we know in Jesus, not only the, the goodness of the penalty that was paid on behalf of our sins, but also, Lord, the goodness and the blessing of all of the success of Jesus that is offered to us by faith. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Thank you, Father, for such a gift. Thank you that you planned it and you purposed in your heart that you would do something such as that. None of us would give our sons or our daughters on behalf of all of mankind, especially a mankind that is so corrupt and so sinful in our hearts. Today we would run to you, Jesus. Today we would revel in the goodness of who you are. We would thank you that our end is not like Good Friday, not like the grave, but our end is with you. Our end is a position that is glorious before you. Our end is... is a reward that we wait for and long to run into your arms and say, Jesus, thank you for all you have given to me. And for you to turn to us and say, welcome to my paradise, my good and faithful servant. You were faithful in little. Come and enter into the joy of your master. Lord, we look forward to that day. And thank you for the reality that Easter and Resurrection Sunday tells us that that is ours through faith in Jesus. Praise you for such a gift. Praise you for such an offering. You deserve all that we can give you, all that we can offer to you. So today we humble ourselves and offer you our very lives, our very hearts. Be our greatest treasure today, we pray be glorified. If you would agree with that, if your heart is moved towards those things and you are excited uh, to be celebrating Easter here at Grace, man, let's stand together and let's lift our voices in song to declare once again the goodness of the gospel of Jesus for us.